Hi everyone, it's Dr. Susan here with the home edition of Your Voice with Dr. Susan. In response to the emergency with this pandemic related to COVID-19, I've been doing online workshops and talks and interviews with different experts to help people cope with all the various challenges that this pandemic has presented for really for all of us. Yay, hi everybody and welcome Dr. Alsay. Michael Alsay is with us. I am so happy that you are here tonight. So Michael is a clinical psychologist and in addition to working directly with people, individuals, families, kids, adult, uh, college age kids, couples, I mean, he works with everybody. In addition to his direct practice, he also is currently the, a mental health counselor for the Manhattan School of Music. He also is a keynote speaker and, ha and does TEDx talks, and he also advises people in TEDx talks, and he's um, an author and lots of other things, and he's a creator. And he's also, which you're gonna be hearing more about soon, an ambivert, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. So welcome, welcome, Michael. Oh, I'm so glad we could do this again. It was so much fun the last time. Yeah. I am so happy that you are here, Michael. We have so much to talk about, but I know that um, I'm going to tell people you did a TEDx talk on um, introverts and mm -hmm. it was fabulous. And tonight we're going to talk about ambiverts and probably introverts and extroverts too. But why don't we start with you actually defining what is an introvert? What is an extrovert and what is an ambivert? Yeah, so I like to use a metaphor of uh, the car. So an extrovert is like the gas-powered car, and an introvert is like an electric car, and an ambivert is a hybrid. So uh, if you notice, at, at around every corner, there's a gas station. Um, there's a lot of ways for extroverts to charge up in our culture. Um, they tend to charge up by being around people. They tend to charge up, uh, t you know, being in the world. And, and so, again, they can get charged up very easily. Um, for an introvert, they tend to charge up by needing to go into their imagination and their ideas, and they kind of steep in it. And, and so they need a certain kind of downtime to charge up, like an electric car. And the ambiverts have the capacity to do both. And, and I think the best ambiverts need to get fueled and charged in order to be at their optimal. And it turns out that we, you know, in the 20th century, we, we prioritize and idealize the extrovert since Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. The extrovert was the sign of true success in our culture, in, in the, you know, the age of media, that was the ticket. And then recently around uh, the early 21st century with Susan Cain's writing of the book Quiet, uh, Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, we've started to re claim and re-examine the power and strength of introverts in their deliberateness, in their thoughtfulness, in their capacity to lead. And I think now the next turn for us is to look at ambiverts because it's something that most of us don't even know anything about. It was actually a, a term that was coined in, I think, 1923 by a hardly known Oregonian psychologist. His name was Conklin. And um, we hardly talk about it at all. And yet, uh, there are some stats that say that about maybe 40 to 60% of us or 65% of us are ambiverts. And so that's consistent with, I know some people have questioned whether ambivert and introverts actually exist, but I see it as a continuum. And so you have in, in, introverts on one side, ambiverts on the opposite, I'm sorry, introverts on one side and extroverts on the other, and then ambiverts in the middle. And, you know, there's probably some people, would you say, that really are on either side, but that a, a majority might be in the middle. And so let's, you know, that was a great way of defining it. And I love the car analogy. Um, if for those people out there that are thinking, wow, well, I'm not sure what I am. How would you help them to define whether they're an ambivert, an introvert, or uh, an extrovert? Yeah, Susan Cain had this really good party trick that I think is an easy way of doing it. Now, of course, you could take the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Uh, um, Daniel Pink, the writer, um, uh, he, he on his website has an ambivert quiz that you could take. So there are ways of doing a kind of self-report to see, but uh, the party trick is, 
if you're an extrovert, you're probably fine with spending five hours or more at a party and you still feel charged up. And in fact, your batteries, you know, your, your car is getting fueled and fueled by being around people. If you're an introvert, maybe one or two hours, you start to feel really drained. If you're an ambivert, maybe somewhere in between those. So, so a lot of it is also about, it's not just about like, you know, some people commonly misperceive it that an introvert is just somebody who's solitary or who's reclusive like Emily Dickinson, um, or that an extrovert has to be the uber extrovert, like Bill Clinton was an uber extrovert. Like he not only loved the campaign trail, but uh, reports are that when he was with people in a room, you couldn't get him out because he loved talking to everybody and he, he loved the energy of people. Um, but it turns out that what we're looking for is the sweet spot of energy. And the thing is that um, extroverts need a lot of stimulation to feel energized. Um, introverts get stimulated pretty easily. And so they retreat to regenerate. And ambiverts kind of need both that external and a good deal of that internal to get their sweet spot. So again, I, I like to think of it also as we all need to find our sweet spot in terms of how we get energized and how we feel fulfilled. And of course, you know, introversion and extroversion are just one dimension of that, but they're pretty crucial. I think a lot of the things we see as problems and, and symptoms are, are the result or the consequence of not knowing how we work best optimally. Um, and who we actually are. And I think, you know, one of the great things about our field in therapy is that we focus a lot on nurture, right? What are your experiences and how does that support or discourage certain aspects of you? But we often sometimes forget nature, right? People are born with a certain nature. People are born generally with a temperament. It's generally going to be either more introverted or more extroverted or somewhere in between. But that is a set thing, and you want to find your proper range within there. Like right? we wouldn't put a certain kind of tree in in the wrong soil, right? It's got a nature. So I think it's important to balance, and that allows us to balance nature and nurture. And the other thing too that you said, Susan, that I think is really important. I think it's important for people, especially within uh, therapy and within teaching is that a lot of us are ambiverts because we enjoy the back and forth of the one-on-one -on -one conversation, but also the bigger group or teaching on a larger level. And so we can be confused. And by the way, this also speaks to something I think that we'll talk about as well is the quickness of our culture to dichotomize, right? To do binary things. You're either this or you're either that, and you can't be both. I mean, in a funny way, that's what polarization is all about, right? Um, this idea of cancel culture, which I'm sure you've heard of, right, is the sense of if you've done anything that goes against what we think is the right way, you cancel everything. And one, that's not really human and it's not really fair. It's actually very perfectionistic. And, and I think one of the reasons that I'm so intrigued by this idea of ambiverts is like as a culture, if our if, if the way we look at how we're built personality wise doesn't even allow for this kind of blending of contradictory and complementary parts, what does that say for our culture, right? What does that say for what more we can do? So, and I think actually some really, really pivotal ambiverts through our history have done amazing things. Like Abraham Lincoln, I think was a really, really important ambivert who is extraordinarily solitary, extraordinarily introverted and introspective, but he also loved telling funny stories in social settings, he loved debating, he loved oratory, and he was the kind of person who could blend this combination and use it to help people transform. That's great. And I know that you are doing a lot of thinking and writing right now about this concept as in terms of how it's related to what's happening in our political world, not just within politics, but the way in which our society is responding to the many issues in terms of, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of um, judging people on, do they believe this or not? Even like around masks, right? I know that yeah. like where, where, you, where you walk outside and suddenly I think that most of us, right? You might be judging people. Is that person wearing a mask or not? And immediately you're, you're forming all these, I know I'm doing it. I'm, I'm yeah. victim, you know, I'm, 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 I'm guilty. We're all susceptible so, to it, yeah. Right, and so I know that you're talking about, and thinking and doing some writing about how it's related to what's happening in our world today. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 trying to convince uh, I'm trying to convince my agent that this is a sexy enough topic that people will want to talk about it. I I think it I think it is. I also think you know one of the things worth working with college students and also just working with people of this generation. It's wonderful that people are so idealistic and wanting to change things. Um, but I and but I think one of the problems of our political culture right now is that we we don't know how to compromise and we also don't know how to carry the messy mixture of what it is to be human. And I think sometimes that, that I, I think I've mentioned this to the last time we talked about is that I think it's, it's a symptom of the perfectionism and narcissism of our culture as if we should be above this kind of messiness of what it is to be real. One of my favorite children's books is the Velveteen Rabbit because you know, what the Velveteen Rabbit learns is that in order to become real, you have to suffer, you have to lose some hair, you have to go through difficult experiences, and that's how you become real. You don't become real by being some airbrushed shiny toy. And I think sometimes, you know, when it comes to politics, and even when it comes to our very well-being, I think we, we don't allow ourselves more room to have this complexity and this nuance. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, I might have mentioned this, but the word complexity is actually something that I've been doing a lot of thinking and writing about myself in terms of complexity and what that means. And we can talk about that another time, mm -hmm. um, too. But yeah, and so, um, you know, the other thing that, that occurred to me um, as you were talking about this is not only in terms of the perfectionistic and, and what we do, but in relationships, it's so important for people to understand the concept, to realize that your partner or your other family member or your friend even may not have the same need as you. And it's because they may, and you can use this lens of right. ambivert, introvert, extrovert, because, you know, when I think about even, you know, years ago, and, and I didn't use this terminology, but it's, it's cause I didn't know I was an ambivert then because I, I work with people and I, I, I have a direct practice and I would spend so many hours and I teach at college and I would spend so many hours in conversations with people that on a long day, I didn't have any energy left for my friends or family. Right. And it wasn't that I didn't love them. I didn't want to be there, but it was just that I was emotionally drained, but it wasn't just emotionally drained. I was an ambivert. So I needed to have my downtime and, and, and that's really important for me to realize and for everyone to realize in terms of who you are so that you can make sure that in order to give to your friends and families and nurture those relationships, that you have to make time in a day to do that because otherwise you're gonna, not going to be able to do that. And you're going to need your solitude and your downtime. Yeah, no, I think you hit it right on the head there. I think it's a combination of understanding how you can be most energized and fulfilled sustainably, right? Right. We talk about sustainability in terms of the environment. We sometimes forget it in terms of our own self-care. Right. 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 And then the other thing, too, is how can we be most productive and creative? And, and I think you're right. I'll, I'll share with you a, a brief story of when I was, um, I was dating my, my wife. We were almost engaged, and I remember going to Thanksgiving for the first time with family with her. And, you know, it was like this long Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, I can't even remember. And, uh, you know, I was talking with everybody. I, I was talking with her family, with family friends, and I slipped away about three hours in and I went into the other room to read. And I could hear them talking about me saying, was it something we said? Is he okay? Do you want to go check on him? And what people didn't understand was, no, I was, I was fine. I just needed to regroup. I needed my introvert downtime and it was no offense to them. And I think you're right that it's important to be able for, for introverts to be able to explain and articulate to their extrovert or ambivert friends that they might need this time. And it's not, it's not a diss or a, um, a way of saying, I don't want to be with you. It's that I'm overstimulated and I need to refill the well. And that is so important. And I, I know I see this in couples all the time in terms of them just going and doing a behavior. And then, you know, we make up, we're really expert at making up stories in our head, right? Because yeah. we think it's, we're, we're all so self-centered. We're all self-centered. So what happens is when our partner or our, 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 a significant other or a child or a parent does something, we're always thinking it's us, right? right? So immediately we go, oh my goodness, you know, they don't like me or they, you know, they're dissing me or I feel abandoned by them. Instead of, you know, if somebody would say, I need to do this. It's like, oh, 
you need to do that. Okay, then, then right. we'll do that. But we, we make up these stories in our mind. And I, I, I know I'm, I'm guilty of it too. We're, we're all but guilty we're of it because right? we're, we're trying to make attributions of what things are and it makes us feel a sense of control if it could be it's something that I did or didn't do. It As, makes us feel less in control uh, to, to not know. That's why children do it all the time, right? If something is making my parent upset, it must be that I've, I'm doing something wrong or I am bad. And so you're right. And I think it's, you know, the onus is both on uh, people to be more sensitive and curious about the possible complex reasons behind the behavior, but also, and I coach introverts on this too, it's also important for us to be able to give language to it. And so I, I you know, I eventually said to my wife, you know, if I slip away after a few hours, I don't want you to take it offensively. It's because I just need to regroup. And it actually means that I've had such a good time that I just need to sort through it and then come back. That's a great way of saying it. Yeah, that's great. So a lot of this stuff, you know, needs translating. And the same thing, by the way, I'm going to hold introverts accountable here too, that introverts need to understand that extroverts feel like without enough stimulation, they feel under stimulated themselves. And so they feel bored. They feel restless. They feel lonely. And so it's not that they're trying to be uh, annoying by saying, why don't you come to the party with me? Right. Right. Or that they can't sit and read with you, right? Right. You know, why can't you just sit and read with me? Because I can't. Like, I need to be with people and have conversations. right? Right. So again, I think it comes down to looking at it as a fundamental energy thing. And, you know, since so much of life is about making sure we tap into the right energy so that we can be creative and happy and productive, I think it's a glaring kind of oversight on psychology's part and the culture's part not to look at this closer. Yeah. And I also want to just add in when you were talking about, you know, we were saying how kids and we have to make up, we think about ourselves and that we always think that it's something that we did. There's another piece to this is that we as humans, we always want to find the reason for things. We need to explain things. So we can't just say, okay, you know, honey, you want to go and do that. It's like, well, why do you want to do that? We're always, so if we don't know the reason, we're going to fantasize. And, and usually it's not going to be in there. And it's not going to be in their benefit, right? The, the reason that we're going to make up in our minds is not going to really work well. So um, I think that's, you know, and, and the language, and I know, and, and I'm sure you do this in your work too with people, is giving them the language because if it was not modeled for you, then you don't know. People don't like, it, it's, and it feels like funny at first, like you want me to say, honey, I need some time to be alone. It's not you. It's just that give me an hour and it doesn't feel quite right. But yes, it works, you know, and it, 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 will make, yeah. it, it really helps, you know, think about what happens when you get that. So it's really interesting. I yeah, there's, you know, there, there's also a social psychological phenomenon that you probably know of called the fundamental attribution error, which is that we fundamentally, when looking at others, think it is the person and not the situation. But when it's ourselves, we can, we have all the backstory. So what happens is we drop out the context. And so we need people sometimes to fill in the context so we get a more nuanced picture. And that's what com- coming back to what we said about why the importance of complexity. Right. Complexity is everything. Context is everything. Right. And so I think it's really, really crucial that, that we're sensitive to others and that they can be sensitive to us. That's great. And I just want to also remind everyone, you will have an opportunity to ask questions because I'm sure that people are buzzing with things in their heads. And so you will have that opportunity soon. I wanted you also to talk a little bit more about introverts because I thought it was really interesting in some of the points that you made um, in some of your writings and in your TED talk, because introverts aren't always credited with being as observant and as brilliant as they, as they are. Um, it's not a matter of intelligence, it's just a different type of processing and energizing, but you make some really great points about the characteristics and what's happening inside an introvert's uh, being and mind. Could you t- talk a little bit about that? I think traditionally introverts, or recently, like in the past 50 to 100 years, introverts have been passed over because they're not, um, they're more modest, typically. Um, they don't need the energy, so they're happy to do the work. They're, they're also deliberate about things. And so um, sometimes they get misconstrued as not being as entertaining, perhaps, or as out there. Um, but there have been so many um, you know, important introverts 
throughout history, whether it was Rosa Parks or uh, Eleanor Roosevelt or, um, gosh, Gandhi. I mean, there's so many, um, or Steve Wozniak as a tech, you know, a technological introvert. Um, there's so many people that, that are very, very powerful and, and very transformative and, and, and inspirational, but introverts, they just lead in a different way. And, and I think because in, largely in the 20th century, we had this extrovert ideal, as Susan Cain talks about, which told us that successful leaders must be extroverts, right? So even when you have a president, often the question wasn't who is the better president, it was who is more of the extrovert? Right? Who is the person I want to have a beer with? Um, which is why Al Gore, for example, was not the winner. Um, because, because people are like, he's not, he's not extroverted enough. Now, I don't think that's the only reason, but what I'm saying is that there's a way in which we've had this, this funny bias and this funny, and again, um, Susan Cain points this out too, Dale Carnegie, one of the first self-help books in America, is basically about how to be a better marketer of yourself. And essentially, a how-to manual on how to be a better extrovert. So we've conflated extroversion with leadership prowess. And, um, and that's, that's really not true. Um, there are very, sometimes there also can be very quiet, powerful leaders. Warren Buffett is another example of, of an introvert who is very, very brilliant, very articulate, and he leads in a different way. And, you know, it's interesting because I think that's also true in the, in the workforce that people are hired because they do a better interview because they're extroverts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get their work done. And so no. when, you're, when, you're, when you're hiring, you need to look at the work as opposed to the presentation because people can get really seduced by that, right? When you're, when you're interviewing someone, it's the person with the personality that you might think can get the work done, but sometimes ent um, introverts actually or ambiverts get, get it done more so quietly if you need for the, if the job is about sitting at the desk quietly getting your work done because the extroverts are going to be out there talking. We also want to sing the praises of extroverts because extroverts also, um, they're emotional, they're risk takers and they're willing to respond quicker rather than being deliberate. And so, so extroverts are, the, are those in the class who raise their hand first. And so, and that's great. That means they're willing to converse and really to engage. That's a healthy, vibrant part of our culture that we really need. We, also, we just need to make sure we also let the, the introverts and the ambiverts have some time too. But I, I also want extroverts to feel empowered. There's no denigration of them. They bring so much to the table. They always have. They always will. In fact, we see the most transformative moments in history when introverts and extroverts band together. It's no coincidence that Franklin Roosevelt's extroversion was tempered and balanced by Eleanor Roosevelt's introversion or Martin Luther King's extroversion was supported and balanced by Rosa Parks' introversion. Steve Wozniak with Steve Jobs. You know, if you want to say Lennon and McCartney and George Harrison, it just all over the place. So, so the point is that we want to try and figure out how to, how to optimize whether we're an extrovert or an introvert. And by the way, if you're an extrovert, you want to also learn about how to develop your introverted side. If you're an introvert, you want to learn how to develop that extroverted side. What if you're an ambivert? So, because you're giving people yeah. great ideas on if they need to get a partner in business, right? Right. Um, what they should do. But what if you're an ambivert? So if you're an ambivert, what, who should you get to be your partner? <laughs> I think ambiverts also need to have uh, colleagues and friends who are ambiverts, but also extroverts and introverts. And again, but I think one of the things that, that's a special place for ambiverts is to remember that they actually do have a special superpower themselves, right? In fact, Adam Grant, the... Uh, wonderful industrial organizational psychologist, the youngest a tenured professor at Wharton School of Business, um, did an interesting study and he called it the ambivert advantage. He looked at who were the best salespeople and uh, he was wondering whether, was it the extroverts, was it the ambiverts or was it the introverts? Well, everybody always thinks it's gonna be the extroverts, right? They're out there in the world, they're the movers and the shakers. It turns out the, the ambiverts were better than both. And is that because they were able to match both work well with extroverts and introverts, right? Is that, is that yes, part of why? but also something else. What makes an ambivert special is that they're able to deeply empathize and tune into the other's experience and also use their own. 
So they'll listen to the customer to say, what do you really need and what do you really want? And they'll also have their self-interest in how do I make the sale? Interesting. They know when to listen, as, as Daniel Pink yeah. says, and when to shut up. That's great. <laughs> you know, before, that's great. Before we open it up for questions, um, could you talk a little bit about what it's been like for all these types, introverts, ec uh, extroverts, and ambiverts during quarantine? Yeah, and, and maybe yeah. some tips for each, because so as I said before you got on, some people are like starting to go out, right? Some people are putting their toe out there. Some people are getting their whole bodies out. And then other parts of the country are going back into actual quarantine. So right. we're all in different phases. But what, what are some of the things that each of these types um, need to be aware of? And how are people coping given uh, what type of uh, style they have? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, um, there's been interesting memes about it that, um, you know, introverts, it's like they've been preparing for this their whole lives, you know, and, right. you know, or introverts are watching extroverts, like looking and uh, they're thinking how pathetic. Um, it turns out that we're more alike than we are different. And as Jung said, there are no pure extroverts or introverts. The, those would only be found in the lunatic asylum. But, um, you know, it turns out that introverts are doing well because they enjoy this time, but they are surprised that they also need more social connection than they realize. Extroverts who you think would be um, completely nose diving um, because they don't have enough social stimulation are finding ways to cope, whether through Zoom or through other means. And there's even been research that's shown, um, they looked at people pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, and extroverts are not doing as bad as we think but they are much lower on their social connection than they usually are. So they're approaching coming closer to where introverts are. Interesting. So, but I think the take home point is that we're all challenged by finding the balance here. Introverts are finding that some of this can be too much introvert time and too disconnected from the rest of the world as we know it. Extroverts can find, I can do more of this than I thought and I can find ways of adapting. And I think also what we're also realizing is that in some ways we're all built as ambiverts in so far as we all need a healthy dosage of introvert and extrovert time in order to be fully human. And I think in other words, that's also why us therapists love our jobs because we get to embrace both. And I think that is when we are our most creative selves, right? A musician wants to learn how to become a great musician and they do it in solitude, but then they must perform in public to share it with the world. The writer writes in solitude, but writes so it can be read. This is the fullness of being human. That's beautiful. Very well said. Very well said. I actually think you, I loved it so much. I think you should repeat that. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I just think it was very po poetic. So the, can I say it again? The musician? Well, the, mission, the musician composes in solitude and practices mm -hmm. in solitude but the musician revels in performing for an audience. Mm -hmm. And so there is the need to do our inner work and the need to share it with the world. And when we find that balance, that is what is sublime. I really, again, I think that's so poetic. And I know when we spoke the first time, we talked a little bit about the whole creativity and we might have to get you back to talk about creativity. Um, sure. that's, that's a whole nother, a whole nother discussion. So, you know, this has been great. I do want to open it up for questions because I think that people will probably have questions. Hi, Heidi. Did you have a question or a comment or feedback? I, I thought it was extraordinary. I, I had not heard of Ambivert and I was jumping up and down in, in self-recognition, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm so relieved to hear this. <laughs> and I actually hadn't realized the level of self-judgment there had been around it. Um, yeah. You know, of, uh, oh, I'm an introvert. <laughs> you yeah. know, as if it were this burden to carry, and it felt like one. Hearing you reframe it, um, was was fantastic i i have to say i i felt the energy of that you know of of the um the self-acceptance of that and i love what you said heidi too i think this is something that i experienced when i discovered it too is like there's a character in a moliere play and he says to think i've been speaking prose all my life and i didn't even know so when we don't have a word for something that's extraordinarily important 
it affects us. And then there are subtle and sometimes even insidious ways that we can judge ourselves without realizing it. And I think those of us who are more ambivert in disposition will feel that because we're like, wait a minute, I'm extroverted. Why am I tired? Right? Or why can't I stay at this party longer? Or why is this meeting frustrating me and I wish it were over? Or, you know, wait, I'm, I do like my downtime. How come I'm bored because I've been spending a few hours reading? Right? And I think we make decisions about our lives based on those limiting beliefs without even realizing that they're limiting beliefs. You know, so should I start a business where I'm interacting and connecting with people? Hmm, maybe I shouldn't. I'm an introvert. I don't know if that, even though that calls to me, right. well, maybe I shouldn't. And, you know, this was an absolutely liberating conversation. And I think what you and Dr. Susan both said about the power of language, when we can name something, Mm -hmm. and identify it and then build, have a relationship now with the language and that aspect of ourselves that now has been named and can be embraced um, instead of a shadow to push away, I, I think is so amazing. And, and you have opened a huge door of possibility uh, that becomes available to us by, by the act of the naming and then being able to accept it and, and love it. I love that too, and I love it because if we don't have a category for ourselves, we don't. If we don't have a genre for ourselves, we think our music is strange. Yes. Right. And and what I love what you're saying is that when we have that, then we can enjoy it, and and we can become more creative with it, and and we can also understand why we do the things that we do, that there is a method to it. I think that's what the whole enterprise of psychotherapy is: is understanding not only what the method to the madness is, but how you work. And why? And also, it's interesting because it's, it's uh, almost paradoxical for me. It's unpathological, pathologizing. You know, it's almost like we don't want to make it pathology. I know in my work, it's about saying how, no, 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 it's not, it's not crazy. It's not about that. And, you know, this is, this is, as Heidi was saying, it is freeing because whereas you might have used, oh, there's something wrong with me. Am I depressed or am I this? Or why can't I, for instance, you know, my coach is telling me to make phone calls and to talk to other people, but yet I don't want to do that. And it's like, oh, it's not that I can't do that. It's that that's not consistent with who I am. Or like, you know, when people leave, if you're having a party, right? And some people, but you're an extrovert and you can go on for five hours and somebody leaves after two, you think, oh my God, they didn't like me. They didn't like the party. What was wrong? Why didn't, I'm so mad at them for not staying the entire time. Well, maybe they needed to leave and had nothing to do with liking the party or not liking the party. And then you can also plan for yourself and tell people in advance and take responsibility for your own actions by saying, no, nope, just this is what I need. So it's, it's really great. Yeah. yeah and, and Heidi, to your point too, I wanted to actually answer some part of your question too about like when you ask decisions about your work, I was working in college counseling full time and I loved it, but it was too draining. So close to my 40th birthday, uh, I was about to have my wife and I were about to have our first child. I said, I got to get out of this. I just took a wing and a prayer and said, I'm going to do a private practice so that I can do it and have my introvert time and have time with my son. And now I see people in my private practice. I found this part-time gig at Manhattan School of Music. And in between, I'm with my son or I'm writing. And so instead of trying to go against the grain, I've said, wait, this is who I am and, and this is how I work best. This isn't something to be ashamed of. This is something to appreciate. You know, it's kind of like, you know, marching to the beat of your own drum, but it's important. And when we didn't have a category for that, I think it can be very confusing. Well, I think there are huge implications of this in terms of the fulfillment, the tapping into human potential as a society. I mean, I think there are huge societal implications of everything that we're talking about, because if we dismiss people because of a particular label, you're an introvert, you're not a leader, or on societal context of the workplace, and, you know, if people say, okay, the extroverts are the good managers and the good leaders within right. an organization, and then as an introvert, I'm speaking, maybe you can tell, speaking from personal experience, as an introvert, to get feedback 
wow, you know your stuff and, and, and your team loves you and you nurture people, you know, under you and all this stuff, but you're not a tiger. Right. And, and those were the words. And in a very dismissive way, like, well, forget it. If you want to move up, you're not a tiger. And as a, an ent- you know, you're being dismissed for who you are as a, as a negative. What does that say about all the untapped potential that might have been nurtured and used where it could be best used. Yeah, so- and, you know, and you know what turned it around too, Heidi, which is interesting? The startup culture mm-hmm. and the digital revolution re- rebalance the power of introverts. Because a lot of the tech people are introverts who now ascended to power. And we saw they not only get a lot done, they get transformative things done. And they have been open to seeing the potential and promise. And by the way, even a great extrovert like Walt Disney, who is a super extrovert, he gave his animators so much room to tinker in their introverted ways because he was ahead of his time. So, So the funny thing is, you know, a good manager, a good leader, just like a good band, like Duke Ellington was a great band leader, not just because he was a great player, but also because he so listened to his, his musicians that he made compositions that he heard from things that they were playing. And he featured them to showcase what they could do on the instrument. So I think you're right, the transformative leaders, oh, I gotta put this down. I was thinking about Duke Ellington might be a good example of a sort of ambivert too, right? Um, Abraham Lincoln, um, Oprah Winfrey, I think is a fantastic example of an ambivert. Yeah. Meryl Streep. I think Steven Spielberg might be an ambivert. Um, Stephen, Col- Stephen Colbert. Yes. John Stewart, my, my, most likely. Well, probably a lot of people who are in, in the uh, public's eye and who puts themselves out there. Tom, I think you have a question or a comment. I do. First of all, I'd like to thank both uh, Dr. Susan and you, Mike, Michael, as well, for really a very fascinating discussion. I have a question. Uh, And it's really, is there yet another label, which I'd call a contextual vert, which is a lot like an ambivert, but as we talked about introverts and extroverts and ambiverts as as being something that is embodied in you, a contextual vert really pays a lot of attention to the environment, to the audience. Uh, It's a little bit like baseball. There's left, there's righties and there's switch hitters. Yeah who's pitching, how they play. And I'm just wondering if there is a concept or should be a concept of contextual vert. I love that. I love that term. And I think that's brilliant. Um, I, I wrote it down because I don't want to forget it. I think you're right. And I think you're right that um, I think actually that's the missing link in our culture right now um, is that we need more contextual averts you know, contextual verts to be able to look at the details and see the big picture. Um, I, I think that's where Abraham Lincoln was a contextual vert in that he didn't just look at what was happening then, he looked at how it was connected to the founding of the country. He looked at figuring out how to contextualize it with what was pragmatically possible. And I think you're right that a contextual vert is sensitive to their audience. I think there's actually something interesting. People also who have an introverted or ambiverted sensibility have a correlation with high sensitivity, Hmm. like the highly sensitive person. And I think HSPs, as they're called, are by very nature contextual verts. And I do, I do like that. I do really think that would be a contribution to our culture to have something like that because I think we easily run away, and even as I said, that social psychological phenomenon of the fundamental attribution error shows our bias to forget the context. In fact, Tom, I think this is a brilliant point. I'm gonna sing your praises like five times right now, but I think the mission and purpose of psychotherapy is to flesh out and illuminate the context as well as the person. And in so doing, we both look at the foreground and the background simultaneously rather than just looking at one. Tom, I happen to know that you're doing a lot in education right now. And when, when, as you were talking about this concept of contextual vert, I was thinking like, that's what 
the people on your teams really need to be because they think they're using like the notions of education, but they're putting it into context of, okay, online learning, of what's happening, of how to move the dial further in terms of taking our genera- early generations and, and, and looking at how do we apply this to education, both what's happening with online, what's happening in our community, what's happening in other countries, you know, and how do we do that? And, and I think that that's, that's beautiful and, and phenomenal. Um, thank you. I guess maybe it's something I wouldn't have thought about say four and a half years ago, because there's certainly, and I'm not going to go down the path, I'll just say it and be quiet. Uh, there are certain <laughs> contextual knots out there. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's also why it's important for us to be um, really mindful of context in the present, but also, you know what's interesting too, Tom? I think it's also why history is so important. I, I think one of the reasons why history serves a valuable like so is so valuable for the culture is that it provides deeper context for the perennial questions and solutions so so i think you know i think that's why when you look at cultures that are trying to forget history or trying to um sort of gloss over history that that it becomes problematic and by the way i'm not just talking about collective history when people gloss over their individual history they pretend, oh, I, I, you know, I came from poverty, but that doesn't matter. Well, no, no, that's part of a context, and we need to understand how that is part of the story. So I think you're right. I think context is everything. I am writing this down, and Tom, I want to hear more about this after the fact. Uh, I think this is really, really important, the contextual vert. And gosh, we need it now more than ever. I think this is a TEDx talk in the making. Yeah, Tom, I, I would definitely say that that's a TEDx talk uh, to put. And I'm also glad that Heidi has also found uh, the word for her uh, to give her not only permission, but uh, pride to celebrate how she is and and why it's fantastic. Thank you. I I thank you for that. And just to throw another thought, I know we'll we'll be closing. Yeah, go for it. um, In terms of contextual and the new language, um, I have an autistic son and I couldn't help but think of him as you were speaking about introverts you know, it, that's, that's introvert on beyond yeah, the... That's, that's, that's over introvert, right? Yeah. Right. And on yet, overdrive. Uh, yes, completely. And yet in terms of context, he is so focused on the now. Um, there is no context. There is no history. There actually is very little language, at least spoken language. And so you have this purity of state, of the introvert state, and what becomes possible when there is nothing else in the mind's eye? Um, not that there's nothing yeah. else, but in no, that's focus. right. Because because when we get when we stay in our own imagination too long, or we don't see other perspectives, we lose out on a certain richness. We all start from that introverted place. Like I have a two year old, and they start from that place, right? But we also need to imagine others, and that allows us the social connection. Right. And it, and also he has the social connection, but in a very different way, in a spiritual realm and other connections that as an introvert and without the language, how does one express one's own self and truth in that context? Because that's what you're talking about, the full understanding, foreground and background. When those get stripped away, there's the yeah. human being and the human spirit. Yeah, you know, rest. you know what's interesting about that? I think where it comes together is in the symbol. The symbol in literature and art and in language itself is what forms a bridge between our solitary world and our connected world. And even with somebody autistic, I remember I talked with a girl who was autistic in my practice and she shared with me a dream. And in the dream, she was a fish. And in the dream, she felt like she wanted to get out of the container of the fishbowl which I saw as a communication of getting out of an autistic state, Mm. but being able to share it through the symbol. Yeah. She was seeking the bridge. Yes. And that I believe is what the autistic people are doing. They're seeking that bridge, which is the human condition to seek the bridge from the inner to the outer, from us to the other, to each other, the solitary to the, to the group. Exactly. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. 
You know, that's great. And Tom, you know, the other thing I was thinking when you talked about the contextual is, Michael, what you were saying before about what we do in society is it's an either or, it's either good or bad. And we look at people like, you know, there are, there, usually there's not anything, a, a concept of you're either all good or all bad, but we have this idea and society perpetuates that we're all both, right? We're, we're all, I believe we're all good people that sometimes do not such good things. And so, and, and you know, there's a continuum of that, right? But what you're looking at in terms of this contextualized thing, it's in context. Because, you know, I talk often about how when we as humans are in a state where our survival is being threatened, we then are all capable of doing something that looks bad or evil, but it's about surviving. So yeah. it's all, and, and you can't always tell that from the outside. You don't always know when someone is doing something because they're perceiving that their life is being threatened and that their survival is being threatened. And so, you know, this whole notion of contextualism is so important and, 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 and really it's, it's, it's a great thing. So we really should continue to explore that. Yeah, and an interesting, and an interesting politically incorrect, um, you know, thing is if you look at the context between the difference of keeping a statue of Thomas Jefferson versus Robert E. Lee, there's a really different context in terms of who those men were, what they stood for, and the combination and the context, right? Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder. The context of the time, it was not totally abnormal. Is it problematic? Sure, but he also was the architect of things that would get out of it. Whereas if you look at Robert E. Lee, that is also, it is, the context of it was put at a time purely to also show a certain kind of dominance. There's a contextual question there that's nuanced and complex, and it's difficult. It's difficult. But, but context is important. Too many litmus tests out there, going, going back to your comments, uh, yeah. Dr. Susan, of you're in or you're out. You either agree with me or you don't. Yeah, I mean, the, I think being human is being a mixture of things, and that's why I think we gravitate towards Shakespeare. Mm. Well, see, the ability to, be, to hold complexity, right? Yeah. All those different things and not have to choose. Like, oh, this is interesting, this is complex. You know, as, you, as we listen, and I, I experienced this with Michael when I was in conversation with him several weeks ago, you can tell that he really is a literature buff as well. Because, he, you, Michael, you throw out names and you reference literature, it just <laughs> falls off your tongue and it's just like a beautiful thing. But you can really, yes, he is very much into literature as well as music, so. Yes, and so, and so to conclude with a literary quote, Walt Whitman said, do I contradict myself very well then? I am large, I contain multitudes. We all contain multitudes. Yes. And we're all trying to sing the song of ourselves. Great, great remarks. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much, Thank Michael. Thank you, everybody. I'm I had so, so much fun. I'm so grateful that you were here tonight and that all of you joined us. And I know that our listeners are just so grateful, too. And that, you know, if people want to contact you, they can do that through the Mentor Project. It's oh, mentor please, project. yeah. 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 Mentor, mentorproject.org if you want to contact me, Dr. Susan, mentorproject.org, or if you want to speak with Michael or you have a question for him, you can, you can get in touch with us that way. This is fantastic. And as I'm working on the book, I might pick your guys' brains so Yay. I can uh, sell it as a worthy topic. Feel free. And you know, when you're, when you're done with it, you're going to come back on the show and uh, we'll, we'll launch it with you. We'll definitely help you and, and you get to talk about it. So I, I, I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. I'm so appreciative of all of you for being here. Thank you all for listening out there in, in Facebook land and whether you're and listening thank you now for the later. extrovert recharge time for me. Yes. Thank you. And now go, now go with your solid. I'm going to go, go read. read. You're going to go back to, <laughs> right. Right. So I'm going to get us off Facebook by Facebook. So let's Bye everybody. See. And uh, we will stop them. Nice coffee. meeting you. Nice yeah. meeting you too, Tom. Nice meeting you, Heidi. Nice we'll meeting see you them. all next week. We actually may take a break next week, but we'll let you know. Um, but we look forward to seeing you again and uh, have a safe and well week. Thanks everybody. I hope that this series finds you healthy, well, and if you have any questions or comments or need any further information, 
please contact me. You can reach me at yourvoice at drsusan.nyc. Yourvoice at drsusan.nyc or drsusan at drsusancares.com. Drsusan at drsusancares.com. Please be safe. Please take care of you and your loved ones. And I look forward to seeing you at the next episode of Your Voice with Dr. Susan, the home edition. Thank you. Other medical problems don't go away during pandemic. They don't take a vacation. They, they are still there. Uh, so we're still going to have to deal with chronic medical conditions. We're also going to have to deal with other infectious diseases because they're, they're going to crop up as well. You have to look at you know, what type of information is being provided. Uh, so it's one thing to uh, you know, criticize or, or blame something or, or, or say, okay, you know, this person is wrong. But like, what are you providing solutions and are you providing evidence behind your proposed solutions? So, so some of these things are fairly straightforward. Like for instance, it's a virus and the virus spreads from person to person. And so if someone's saying, well, uh, don't use separation in terms of physical distancing. I, I, we, we use the term social distancing. And, and when we say social distancing, we don't mean you know, cut off communication with people, but by that we mean try to keep distance. And if someone's saying, oh, no, we don't do that, well, it's still a virus and it still will spread if there's physical contact. So unless you can provide an alternative to that, then, you know, we, you have to go with that, uh, you have to go with that intervention. So really checking to see if people are walking you through the explanation, this pandemic, epidemic preparedness community, and also includes security experts, have predicted that this would happen, again, when it happens and not if it happens. And so that was the big question, you know, when is it going to happen? And there's been warnings. And the challenge is there hasn't been enough uh, concern and enough support of being more prepared. When we talk about work or we talk about what did, you just mentioned, something really beautiful. You said that there's something that shames us and then we don't try it again. We don't try to do something again because we say, oh my God, I did speaking and then I went on the stage and then there were 5,000 people and I just made a complete fool of myself. The embodied work that I do around shame brings with it a lot of experiential work in the body. And the grounding for what it is that I'm talking about, and you have to imagine you have a vessel, you have a vase, your body is the vase. And the emotions that we have about shame is tons of water coming into this vase, okay? But if the vase is only able to hold a gallon and we are pouring 15 gallons into this vase, the, the vase is either gonna break, it can't handle it, the, the emotions go overboard. So our bodies are the same. The distinction here is that our body is not a glass vessel. Our body is a moving, living, breathing masterpiece that can emotionally get bigger, it can go bigger, and it can contract. The reason why we feel shame is because we're contracted, because we contracted as children. Yet as adults, we have the capacity to stand and breathe and meditate and have our consciousness say, okay, this is just someone yelling at me. This is just a group of people making fun of me. It doesn't matter what they're saying, but that's hard. To get there is hard. We react without thinking. We react unconsciously, and sometimes it doesn't work out. But we also react unconsciously, and it works out just fine. 
You know, you're not thinking about how to type. You're not thinking about how to, uh, to drive a car. And you're also not thinking in social interactions. You know how to react to people in certain ways. Where, where it goes wrong is you've learned a certain way to behave, and that's not working anymore if it ever worked. And you're not aware of it, and you're puzzled by why things are not working out. And that's what when you have to make the unconscious conscious to, to help people out. We're having a conversation, you and I. Um, and we are conscious of having this conversation. So I ask anyone listening, and I'll, I'll ask you, Susan, because I'm talking to you. You know what you're saying. You're conscious of what you're saying. Where did the words come from? Did you think to yourself, I will now use this word? And then you thought about it, and you consciously created it. You just talk. All right, so, so there's an obvious thing. I'm also purposely doing another obvious thing. I'm talking and moving my hands. Why in the world am I moving my hands? I move my hands when I'm on the phone. And I suspect that most of you move your hands when you, are you aware? Do you look at your hands and go, I think I'll wiggle it this way. No, I'll move it that way. It's clearly not a conscious thing. We do it automatically. I can get into the weeds and talk about why we move our hands. The simple answer is that the speech part of our brain is connected to the motor part of our brain. Uh, it's connected to movement. And so we do movement. And the two parts of the brain uh, is really the one part of the brain. It's the movement part of the brain. So that's why we move our hands. So those are everyday unconscious things. Parents are, in our current culture, torturing themselves um, with the list of all the things that they're supposed to be doing. Um, we live in a culture that believes we need to, and this is everywhere. This is in our workplaces. This is in our leadership development. This is in our workouts. We need to optimize and maximize every element of our life, right? Nobody goes jogging anymore. They do an ultra marathon. Nobody just does crunches. They go do CrossFit. And the same thing has come into our parenting. Um, so that parents are so concerned about giving their kids an optimal childhood experience that they're tormenting themselves with guilt. In most cases, kids are pretty self-optimizing. They don't need us to tinker with every little thing about them. They typically are pretty good at pursuing what they need for development. And, and what is that? They need to mess around with stuff and figure it out. They need social interaction and friends, um, which obviously is a little challenge right now during social distancing. And they need parents that show them support and love. And, and when you have those basic things, kids tend to do really very well. Couple exciting studies. One is that, um, they found that you can actually fill your sense of social support through things that don't involve people. So it turns out that things like those guilty pleasures, like binge watching that show you like, or reading a book, or even eating comfort food, careful with that one, actually can make us feel socially full.